In 2014, pilots that were flying over Siberia saw something really disturbing. It was a gigantic hole in the ground, about 80 feet wide and 150 feet deep. And the disturbing part about this is that it was not there before. The photos are absolutely unreal. And when I first saw them, I thought, okay, maybe this is just a giant sinkhole. Sinkholes form when the ground beneath the surface gets dissolved or eroded and worn away by something like groundwater, for instance. Eventually, when the hole beneath the surface is big enough, the surface, which no longer has anything to support it, caves inward, swallowing everything that is on top of it and usually sucking some things in around it. Pretty scary, but not unheard of. And I never thought I'd say this, but unfortunately, this isn't a sinkhole. Because sinkholes collapse into themselves, the rims of the sinkhole have pretty distinct looks to them. But upon closer inspection, scientists actually realized that this new hole in Siberia is surrounded by debris that seems to have been thrown hundreds of feet away from the epicenter of the hole. This is something that you'd expect to see if an object smashed into the earth, forcing all the dirt to go flying in different directions and leaving a giant crater. And craters are nothing new on the planet Earth, but the craters that we're used to were formed by, I don't know, asteroids hitting the planet. And as far as we can tell, there is no sign of any object smashing into the earth and creating this hole. So if it's not the result of the ground caving in, and it's not the result of an object smashing into the earth, what created this gigantic hole in Siberia? It turns out this hole in the ground is part of a concerning pattern. These craters are being formed by massive underground explosions. The general consensus is that it's probably not good. In this video, we're going to discuss some of what we know so far about these giant holes in the ground and why the location where these explosions are happening is so incredibly important. Let's get started. One huge clue about what's going on with these craters comes from satellite imagery, which shows that at least five of the new Siberian craters were preceded by the formation of what's known as a pingo. Pingo is the Inuit word for little hill. Normally, a pingo is formed when water flows under frozen ground, freezes, and then pushes everything upwards. Typical pingos usually have ice at their center and tend to take a really long time to form. I think the oldest known pingo is something like 1200 years old. They're known to rise and fall with the seasons and when they do resolve, they tend to collapse into themselves. But pingos that appear before exploding craters tend to form very rapidly, like over a few years. Satellite imagery of an exploding crater that formed in 2017 showed that the pingo happened as recently as 2015. Another clue about what's causing these explosions can be found in the actual craters themselves. Scientists have found elevated levels of methane in the water pooling at the bottom of the crater, which suggests that the gas is bubbling up from below. As a result, these craters are called GECs, or gas emissions craters. Now let's talk about why the location of these exploding craters is a cause for concern. The fact that this is happening in the Arctic is a big deal because 23 million square kilometers of the Northern Hemisphere is covered in permafrost. Permafrost is any type of soil sediment or rock that has been frozen for a minimum of two years. The oldest recorded permafrost was found in Siberia about 164 feet down and is estimated to be about 650 thousand years old. So why is it such a big deal that these explosions are happening in permafrost? Great question. It turns out that a small change in permafrost can have a major impact on our environment. Case in point, the drunken trees of Alaska. So for many years, scientists have observed trees growing in odd directions, leaning and eventually toppling over in places like the black spruce forest in central Alaska. It turns out these drunken trees, as they're referred to, are the result of permafrost melting and turning the once hard ground into a soggy mess. 
Now, a certain amount of permafrost thaw is to be expected, but climate change is speeding this up to an unprecedented rate, creating drunken trees across lowland forests in Canada, Alaska, and northern Eurasia. The erosion caused by this melting permafrost isn't just a threat to trees and wildlife either. Melting permafrost is known for cracking pavement and damaging things like roads, people's homes, pipelines, among many other things. But permafrost isn't just frozen ground. It's everything that was on and in the ground when it froze, like plants, animals, microorganisms, and gases that get released and reactivated if the permafrost is disturbed. Permafrost holds twice as much carbon as we have in the atmosphere in the form of partially decayed plants and animals. When the permafrost thaws, the microorganisms in there awaken and start to break down those plants and animals. The result of this metabolic process is the release of gases like carbon dioxide and methane. Methane is really important in this case because over a 20 year period, it has a warming potential that's 86 times higher than carbon dioxide. So you have this compounding problem. Climate change causes the thawing of permafrost, which releases microorganisms that go through a metabolic process that release gases that speed up climate change. And this process is the potential explanation for the formation of these exploding craters. A recent study suggests that gas emission craters form when subterranean methane accumulates under permafrost, causing pressure to build until the land gets deformed and eventually explodes. Scientists think this is associated Associated with rising temperatures causing the permafrost to thaw and release these gases, which makes sense since the Arctic is warming twice as fast as the global average. In 2003, scientists found an amoeba frozen in the Siberian permafrost and that amoeba was infected with a 30,000 year old giant virus. What's a giant virus? Great question. Two things put a virus in the giant category. Number one, the viruses that we're used to dealing with have a few genes that are dedicated to things like replication and the formation of capsids, which is what buds off and generally makes them infectious. These viruses, these giant viruses, have way more genes than we're used to, and we don't know what all of those genes do. The second feature that makes a virus a giant virus is its size. In fact, when the giant virus was found in 2003, it was misclassified as a bacterium because it was so big. Giant viruses are so big that you can see them with light microscopes, but the viruses that we're used to looking at are so small that you can only see them using electron microscopy. It gets so much worse. So the paper about the giant virus found in 2003 was actually published in 2015. And when the paper was published, it noted that since the original giant virus discovery, two additional giant viruses were found in the Siberian permafrost. So there's that information. Let's just be clear here for a second. There are many viruses on the planet right now that do not infect people or animals, but I don't really want to roll the dice on the whole giant ancient virus thing to see what happens. You know, it's, I'm not trying to see what it has in store. You know, in that paper that was published in 2015, they noted that they were able to revive two of those viruses. On top of all of that, we have this gem of a quote from one of the authors of the paper, and it says, and I quote, the fact that two different viruses could be easily revived from prehistoric permafrost should be of concern in a context of global warming. I could have told you that without you waking up the zombie viruses. I could, just, I could just told you that from my house. Can we just take a vote that if scientists find something frozen or suspended in time, they don't try to like wake it up? Can we do like a change.org petition? There's just, I don't understand why that needs to happen. So to recap, we don't know exactly what's causing these massive exploding craters, but it probably has something to do with methane gas buildup, which signals something larger and more concerning about the environment. Surface temperatures are warming at a rate twice as fast as the rest of the planet, which could in turn cause permafrost to thaw too rapidly, which is just a Pandora's box that we don't wanna mess with. There's a lot going on 
on the planet right now. All of this highlights the importance of being good stewards of our planet because we already have enough going on in this timeline. We do not need to go defrosting ancient plants and animals and viruses and microbes and extra methane and throwing all of that in the mix. We have enough to deal with already. That's all for this episode, and if you come across a 30,000-year-old virus frozen in the Siberian permafrost, maybe just leave that alone. Maybe just let it rest. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. 